that's true. No, no, hey. Okay, uh, good morning, Bon uh, Welcome to the National Press Theater. We are here for a, a mental health announcement with the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland, also Ministers Ian Holland and uh, Sachs. I understand the ministers have brief remarks and then we will start with questions. We'll start with questions in the room and then if we have time, we will go to uh, Zoom after that. And I understand uh, the minister has to attend, well, the ministers all have to attend cabinet at uh, 10, so we have 20 minutes for questions. So ministers, please go ahead. Okay, we'll try to Zoom through. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Bonjour. First, I'd like to say a few words about the new measures our government is introducing in the upcoming federal budget to improve access to mental health services for young Canadians. I'll then hand over to Minister Yara Sachs, who will provide further details. And then Minister Mark Holland will be discussing the work that he is currently doing to improve health care in Canada. And finally, Minister Marcy Ian will also be saying a few words. Over the past two weeks, our government has been out across the country talking about generational fairness. That's because today, too many younger Canadians feel as though the deck is stacked against them. They can get a good job, they can work hard, but far too often, the reward of a secure, prosperous, middle-class life remains out of reach. We want their hard work to be rewarded. And we have a plan to help every generation, especially younger Canadians, get ahead. We're doing this by turbocharging the construction of new homes across the country. Among the many new measures we've announced over the past few days is a $15 billion top-up to our apartment construction loan program. And we're taking new action to protect renters' rights and unlock pathways for them to become homeowners. We're making life cost less with measures like building more affordable childcare spaces and delivering free contraceptives through our National Pharmacare Plan. We're growing the economy in a way that is shared by everyone including by investing in cutting edge technologies like AI that will boost our productivity and create more good paying jobs for Canadians. And today, we're announcing new measures to improve access to mental health services for younger Canadians. This is a really important part of ensuring generational fairness. We want younger Canadians to have the support they need so that they are set up for success. That's why in the budget, we will be announcing a new $500 million youth mental health fund. The fund will help community mental health organizations across the country provide more access to mental health care for younger Canadians right in their communities. Because better funding for mental health services means that younger Canadians can get the help they need right when and where they need it most. L'annonce d'aujourd'hui donne suite à l'investissement sans précédent. It builds on the unprecedented nearly 210 years to improve This includes access to mental health and addiction treatment services. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I will now turn over the floor to my dear colleague, Minister Sachs. Thank you so much, Deputy Prime Minister. Merci à tous. Welcome to colleagues, and thank you for all who are joining us today. I'd like just to take a moment to acknowledge that we're gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I am so thrilled to discuss the new Youth Mental Health Fund coming in Budget 2024. This is a once in a generation investment in youth, our country's future, at a time when they need it most. 
Today, mental health is an issue that people discuss throughout the country. People are starting to understand that they're entitled to not feeling well. I remember a time when mental health was never discussed. To struggle was to be not seen, and also, if you were seen, to be seen as weak. But now, thanks to the growing awareness and advocacy efforts around mental health, We've begun to chip away at the stigma, and it's becoming easier to have those open and sometimes hard conversations that are so needed. But many challenges still lie ahead, and we need to continue breaking down the stigma. We need to treat mental health just as seriously as we do our physical health. We need to create an accessible and equitable system of care so that all Canadians have access to the mental health services and supports they need when they need them and where they need them. Since being named Canada's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions last summer, I've had the opportunity to travel across the country to meet with people from all walks of life and to hear their stories. Je sais que la dernière année en I know that the past few years have been extremely difficult for many Canadians. I know that students and young people in, in, in particular have been struggling. Pandemic and the measures taken to address it affected all of us in some way, but especially our young people. School closures, social isolation, and uncertainty about the future took a real toll on our youth and their mental health. On a personal note, speaking as a mother of two teenage daughters during the pandemic, I saw this firsthand and talked to so many parents, their kids, and families experiencing the same thing that we were. We've now passed the emergency phase of the pandemic, and kids are thankfully back in school and back to socializing with their peers. But we do find ourselves navigating another challenging period. Many Canadians right now are facing stress and anxiety due to war, geopolitical unrest, climate change, and financial strains. And in this context, young people often do not have the tools that they need to cope in navigating these spaces. Our government is committed to improving the health and mental, uh, the health and mental well-being of all Canadians, including our youth. We are transferring billions of dollars to the provinces and territories to support health care, including mental health care, over the coming years through both an increase in the Canada Health Transfer and the new 10-year bilateral agreements, health care agreements. Chose important en termes de financement accordé pour les soins de santé. Importantly, one-third of the health care funding in these new bilateral agreements has been committed to mental health initiatives. We are positioning mental health as a fundamental and fully integrated aspect of our health care system. But we've made other important progress as well. Firstly, our investment in our country's first ever three-digit suicide prevention number 988, which was launched last November. On November 30th, with the launch of 988, we partnered with the Centre for Mental Health and Addiction, and now 988 is available, available across Canada in both English and French 24-7, 365 days a year. If someone is struggling with suicidal thoughts, all they need to do is to call or text 988 to speak with a trained, compassionate responder. They will listen to you without judgment and offer support through a moment of crisis. This is critical care when it's needed most, and we know that 988 is saving lives. We are also supporting community-based projects that tackle specific issues affecting youth, from the mental health impacts of the pandemic, to gender identity, and to family violence. Community organizations are a lifeline when it comes to youth mental health. And through our innovative approaches, like establishing the integrated youth service hubs across the country, fondly known, to, known as IYS, we are transforming how youth health and social services are delivered in communities across the country. I've had the privilege to visit several community organizations and IYS hubs across Canada to see this work in action. Cependant, ce travail nous a également permis de détecter des lacunes réelles. This has allowed us to notice what the real challenges were in the area of mental health care. We know that when it comes to our youth and serving diverse Canadians, we also have to acknowledge that they live in every part of this country, but also come from many different communities. And serving diverse Canadians, particularly when it comes to our Indigenous youth, 
is work that we still have not done enough of yet. We know we can and must do more. And that's why today's announcement is so important, because we're announcing an additional investment in our youth in Budget 2024 of $500 million over four years to create a new youth mental health fund. With this fund, we'll go farther to support the broader mental health system through the community organizations that know our young people best. The Youth Mental Health Fund will support community mental health organizations so they can continue to add capacity, fill gaps, and ensure youth have the support that they need. Prioritizing mental health support is not just a matter of compassion. It's a matter of public health, it's a matter of social equity, and it's a matter of our economic prosperity. By focusing on youth mental health, we can address the mental health issues before they worsen or become chronic. We can make sure our young people are resilient and have the supports that they need to succeed, not fall through the cracks. This is about building a happier, healthier future for every generation. I will now turn it over to Minister Holland. Merci. Merci, Yara, and merci. Uh, thank you, Yara. Merci, uh, uh, Christia and, and Marcy thank you, Christia and Marcy, for this opportunity to be here with you. This is so critical for our health care system, the capacity to improve uh, our community-level capacity to support people with mental health challenges is absolutely critical. Uh, uh, it's part of our focus on creating the best, best health care system in the world. It's extremely important when we're talking about investments of this nature um, to see it in its totality. To imagine uh, this country, which already has one of the best health care systems in the world, to have the best health system in the world, clearly, um, that is able to uh, drive uh, the types of results that not only mean more equitable health outcomes, uh, better access to care, but uh, prevention, to make sure that uh, folks don't get sick in the first place, uh, that they avoid illness, or in the case of mental health, uh, that they get the, health, the help and support that they need. And this uh, fund recognizes those solutions exist at a community level. Uh, understanding that, that you build from the ground up by understanding what is needed. And it's part of an integrated approach um, that we're taking to make sure that Canadians have um, the health they need in order to lead happy and, yes, productive lives. We can't talk about a strong economy without having a strong uh, health care system and without having people in an excellent state of health. Uh, that isn't just a matter of social justice. That is fundamentally an issue of productivity. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when we make these investments, we talk about the numbers, but we don't talk necessarily about how much money is it going to save, about how much it's going to improve our productivity, about how critical these, uh, these investments are, like building the right foundation to a building, uh, to the type of country we want to have. And I want to speak just for a second about how uh, the, this investment today that we're talking about to help communities build their capacity builds upon the bilateral agreements that we've signed everywhere across the country. Avec un esprit de cooperation, avec chaque province Through a spirit of cooperation with each province and territory, we intend to improve the quality of health care, and specifically, there are actions that can be taken in the area of, ment of mental health. In the Yukon, for example, uh, the agreement that we signed in that territory is going to see uh, mobile opioid treatment clinics, and the territory uh, is going to have uh, a solution that actually gets to meet cl uh, clients where they are to provide same-day appointments, medical testing, and frontline medical treatments uh, for all substance use disorders and for mental health. In Ontario, the deal has critical investments for Indigenous mental health and additional services. It also has critical investments in expanding uh, crisis level prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery at a community level. In Nova Scotia, the deal will see uh, provinces create a universal mental health and addiction services system uh, so that Nova Scotians can have greater access to addiction and mental health services where and when they need it. The agreement will also scale up the province's integrated youth services model for more sites across the province delivering better, better mental health care for youth. It's just a few examples of what's possible when we all work together and pull in a single direction to improve the health of Canadians. These agreements build upon other work that we're doing that don't stand in isolation, but rather support 
uh, the strongest healthcare system that we can build. The action that we're taking right now in dental care, 1.7 million seniors so far have signed up to get uh, oral health care. These are folks that have never seen an oral health professional before. Uh, not only is that critically important to their, uh, to their health, uh, to their physical health, but to their mental health. Somebody who hasn't been able to replace their dentures in 20 or 30 years, finally getting to be able to do that. Somebody being able to go in and have a clean, happy smile that they're proud of what that does to their dignity, to their ability to exist in the world. Uh, when we think about what we're doing uh, with respect to pharmacare, making sure that every woman everywhere in the country has uh, autonomy over their own body and control of their reproductive future and sexual health is not only important as a matter of social justice, as I said before, but actually is critical in terms of their mental health and having control over their own lives. And so, too, is the action we're taking on diabetes. You know, when we're talking about young people, when we had the announcement on Pharmacare, I had an opportunity to talk to a young person here in Ottawa who's talking about the implications of not having access to diabetes medication. How hard is it to be a child in this world uh, with all of the difficulties that are going on? And to add on top of that, not being able to afford your diabetes medication, worrying whether or not you're going to be able to get the medication that's going to stop you from having other serious health complications. I don't think that's the kind of country we want to be in. And of course, it's not hard to imagine the cost of a child not having access to the medication that they need, not only to their future health, but to their ability to contribute to their country. And I would say lastly, I was so proud, I believe it was last Monday, Christia, we were uh, making an announcement on uh, food nutrition, making sure that every child in this country has access to healthy food. We know that food is medicine. And when a child has the dignity of having a full stomach, uh, not only does that mean that they could be more proud and have more self-esteem, but they're going to be able to learn. They're going to be able to uh, lean into their dreams uh, and be able to imagine a better future for themselves. So all of this, collectively, is not individual action. It's collective action to put health, uh, I think, at the center of our thinking about what our country can be and what we can achieve. And when we don't make these kinds of investments, uh, frankly, uh, it will have devastating impacts on uh, the future costs of our health system uh, and, and certainly on productivity. Et maintenant, c'est un grand plaisir de... And now it's a great pleasure to turn over the floor to Marcy, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mark, good morning. So we're addressing an issue that, while magnified during the recent years of the pandemic, certainly didn't begin there. The mental health of young people. La santé mentale de nos jeunes. Many of us, especially young people, found space to confront the realities of mental health, often brushed aside in the hustle of everyday life or everyday life challenges. The experiences of young people, though different, share a common thread, uncertainty. So consider young people in communities, high school students on the cusp of adulthood, feeling the pressures of making life-altering decisions, filled with questions about their future, about their education, about their careers, about their identities. And as young people transition into new stages of independence and responsibility, higher education, early career stages, college, university, all while exciting, bring the pressures of things like academic success, social integration, and often living away from home for the first time. Recent grads struggle to find employment, to adapt to the realities of gig work, all while managing the financial pressures of student debt and the pressure of finding affordable housing. Then there's young adults entering the workforce, or maybe they're taking a gap year or exploring other educational opportunities. They are faced with the challenge of finding their place in this world without the structured support systems they once had. All of this while trying to cope with the lingering scars of the pandemic, and those scars are there. I've chatted with young people from every corner of this country, from Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, to Inukshuk High School in Iqaluit, 
to George Brown College and my writing of Toronto Centre, and I've heard stories of isolation, again that word uncertainty, and for too many the daunting challenge of just finding help. Many students shared with me that when they reached out for mental health supports, they faced waiting times anywhere from three months to one year. So imagine seeking help in your darkest times, only to be told, hold on, you need to wait. Imagine asking for help when you're not okay and you're told to wait. This isn't just a failure. It's a call to action, a reminder that we must do better. So in hearing these stories, in seeing the faces behind the statistics, our response has been shaped by an unwavering commitment to listen, to understand, to act. We hear you. You need more accessible mental health support, so we're creating a youth mental health fund, expanding the on-campus mental health fund, and integrating services within communities because that's so important, that are both accessible and culturally diverse. Our commitment is to shorten the distance between seeking help and finding it, so that no one has to handle this alone or wait months upon months for a lifeline. So that no one has to face this situation of having to wait for months before they can receive any help. Whether you're a high school student or post-secondary student, a young person just trying to navigate the workforce, everyone deserves access to mental health supports that are both immediate and also effective. We've shown our commitment to listen, to understand, and most importantly, to act. We heard you when you told us you felt overwhelmed by the financial pressures of student loans. So we eliminated interest on Canada student loans. We heard you when you asked for more opportunities to gain work experience. So we invested in Canada summer jobs. We heard you when you talked about the struggle to afford housing. So we're building more homes. We heard you when you said transitioning from renting to owning a home was really difficult. So we're making sure that rental history counts towards your credit score. We heard you. informed decisions about your health, so we're making contraceptives free. Each of these actions stems from our commitment to not only listen, but to respond with meaningful action. We've heard you. We're determined to make a difference in the lives of young people by addressing financial, educational, how work for a more supportive, inclusive society. Today, as we continue to move forward with a clear message to young people alone, because we see the to support you and to work towards a future where mental health is never a barrier to anyone's, and I repeat, anyone's potential. Merci beaucoup. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, ministers. Uh, we are now going to start the question period. Donc, on va commencer la période des questions. Um, I am cognizant of the time, though we did start a bit late, so I do want to make sure that uh, we get uh, as much opportunity for questions. And uh, if I could encourage the ministers to keep their responses uh, as short as possible so we can uh, move through the room. Uh, first question, Tessie Sanchi, Hill Times. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'd like to take you, ministers, back to 2021 when you promised a fund for universities, a mental health fund for universities specifically. It was also supposed to be 500 million over four years to help hire up to 1,200 mental health counselors. Just curious, you're announcing a similar fund, but it's much broader in scope. Does this fund replace that 2021 promise? to anyone who wants to answer. Uh, I'm happy to, why don't you go start ahead. I, I, Yeah, I, I, I can get back to you on that. I think that there's, um, I don't have an immediate answer for that. So I'll ask, is that promise of 2021 still on the table? Because I'm talking to universities who are waiting for that fund. Yeah, I think that, um, look, there's absolutely no question uh, that the needs that exist for young people and mental health are enormous. And, uh, and so what, uh, what I would point you to is, the bi bi first, the bilateral agreements that we signed um, with all provinces and territories, which have uh, very meaningful investments in mental health and every 
supports for young people. Um, in the second order, um, this is an acknowledgement that we have to do even more, uh, that we have to go further, uh, that the, uh, the, 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 the and, I, and these are really substantive investments that are taking place in, um, uh, in mental health, but that when we talk to folks at a community level, and you would have heard it across the table here, um, being able to, uh, in different settings, specifically for youth, whether or not it's in a college or a university setting, or whether or not it's in a setting where you have young people who aren't engaged in post-secondary education, uh, or when you're talking about youth who aren't even at the point of being engaged in, um, in, in education after uh, high school, uh, building supports at a community level is, is really what this is about. And so I think it builds upon those commitments um, and it manifests them in a very direct way. Uh, so that, I, I, I wasn't the Minister of Health at that point in time, so I have to go back and see what was said there and be able It was to an election promise. No, no, for sure. Yeah. But, but, I, but, I, but what I can say is that what is manifest is going much further than, than what that commitment was in that, in that platform. That if you look at the actions that we've taken in totality, uh, not just what is announced here today, but in the bilateral agreements uh, with each and every province and territory, it goes significantly further than what was committed in, uh, in that 2021 uh, platform. And is, and is an actual manifestation in a, in a real world application of, of how we can help young people with their mental health. Yeah, and I'm just gonna just uh, swing in there to say um, the 2021 campaign and the commitments on health care broadly that we made there fed directly into the agreement with the provinces that we announced in February of last year. That was a huge, huge investment, unprecedented by the federal government in our country's health care system, including mental health. $200 billion. And that was not a one-off in February of last year. That is money that is flowing today and is going to flow for the next 10 years. As Mark said, and I encourage anyone who is really interested in what is happening on health, take a look at the agreements that he is negotiating with specific provinces and territories as part of that $200 billion unprecedented investment. And you will see very significant investments in mental health. And more broadly, our government, I would say, more than living up to the campaign commitments of 2021 on a major health care investment. So that would be point one. And then point two, we also recognize uh, that in addition to supporting the provinces and territories who are the order of government in Canada that delivers health care, which is something we respect, and what we've been doing is giving them more money and talking to them about some benchmarks that they need to hit as part of getting that huge $200 billion injection of money. That's what Mark has been working on. But on top of that, we recognize, as you've heard very eloquently from my colleagues, that young Canadians in particular face really urgent mental health care needs and that there is a role for community organizations to meet them where they are in their communities and provide some additional support. That's what this funding is about. Okay. I, I will continue on the university's front. Um, because I am speaking to representatives of universities who are wondering why you haven't fulfilled this promise. Could, would health centers, um, excuse me, based on campuses actually count as a community health organization if they wanted to get access to this fund? I'll, I'll take this and, and I'll push back a little bit. <clears throat> First of all, to say that during, um, we did, launch an initial pilot program of peer support on five university campuses across the country as a first step into this in consultation with student university organizations to see what was needed and to have a better understanding of what's happening on campus to our, with our youth. Um, the needs of youth on campus have changed significantly as well. Um, those who came in during the pandemic had particular challenges. Those who were in high school and then came to university after um, the emergency phase of the pandemic faced different challenges. What this fund specifically is trying to do is broaden 
how we look at assisting our young people in their mental health because we want to take an upstream approach. We don't want to see university students on campus in crisis. We want to be able to meet them where they are to give them tools before they get to that point. So in establishing a youth mental health fund at this time that will really be in consultation with student services on university campuses just as much as we are with community organizations across the country including our integrated youth service programs is to really understand how we provide a continuum of support for our young people where they are not everyone's on campus our young people are exploring careers and opportunities outside of those frameworks as well this fund allows us to really meet a broader range of youth across the country to make sure they have the tools they need. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Olivia Stefanovic, Stefanovic CBC. And a uh, reminder, one question, one follow-up, and uh, we'll try to keep things moving along. Good morning. My question is for the Deputy Prime Minister. There's an Opposition Day motion today calling on your government to hold an emergency carbon tax meeting with the Premiers, all Premiers. Will you hold that meeting? Um, our government has been very clear, and the Prime Minister has been very clear about our position on the price on pollution. I think any discussion of the price on pollution needs to start with the reality, and that is that our rebates deliver more money to 8 out of 10 Canadians than they pay in. The rebates are really an affordability measure that help the most vulnerable. We can't lose sight of that in this conversation. Second thing that is really, really important, and I'm speaking now as the finance minister, um, for us to recognize is in 2024, it is not possible to have an economic plan without having a climate plan. And the reason for that is really simple. Canada is a trading nation. If we want foreign investors to invest in Canada, if we want other countries to buy what we are producing, we need to have a strong climate plan. Otherwise, Canada will simply not be able to participate in the global economy. And that is really important for people to recognize as well. And then finally, um, since you raised the question of the premiers, uh, I think it's uh, really important also for us all to remember that there are a couple of provinces and a territory um, who have their own provincial territorial climate plans. Those meet the federal benchmark, they work, they are widely supported by the people of BC, by the people of Quebec. Those are plans, by the way, that were put in place you know, in BC by a center-right government, a world-leading plan. And our government is really, really open to any province or territory coming forward with its own provincial or territorial plan. That's a conversation we'd love to have. Thank you. With respect, I didn't hear a clear answer on whether you will hold this meeting. But just as a follow-up on another topic, do you plan to ch change mortgage, mortgage amortization rules for first-time home buyers to help them get into the housing market? Um, thanks for the question. Um, and we have, we really recognize that housing is an urgent challenge, if not the urgent challenge for Canada, uh, and especially for young Canadians. And that is a challenge that we have a real responsibility to meet. Uh, the center of our response is supply, supply, supply. It's really a question of the numbers. Canada, because of decades of underinvestment, just doesn't have enough homes for Canadians. And we are determined, working together with all levels of government, with private and public sector, partners to fix that and we are and you have seen really energetic really vigorous efforts to do that it's really important for us that young Canadians 
not only know, but that the reality for young Canadians is that the dream of home ownership is in reach. That's why we launched the first home savings came available in April. Half a million people have opened those accounts. That shows young Canadians believe they can buy a home and want to buy a home. That is why we're helping renters using payment of rent to improve their credit score, to build a credit score so they can qualify for a mortgage. So we're very focused on helping young Canadians buy that first home. And beyond the measures we've already announced, I don't have new announcements in that space today. All right, uh, next, <clears throat> next question, uh, Najud Almelis, uh, uh, Canadian Press. Um, hi, Minister Freeland. Um, normally, there's some secrecy around budgets. I remember, you know, previously, budget ahead of budgets, your answer would be um, you can't talk about it until the budget. So I'm wondering if you could uh, um, explain why your government has chosen to essentially lay out the budget ahead of the actual date. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Najud, for the question. Um, we recognize that this is a challenging time for a lot of Canadians and a really pivotal moment. And we think we owe it to Canadians to explain to them what it is our government is doing to meet the moment. Very often um, on budget day, all of you um, are met with a flurry of announcements. Uh, laying out our plan step by step, day by day, is an opportunity for Canadians to hear from us what it is we're doing and for there to be a real, thorough, reasoned, fact-based debate about a number of the measures. And I think that's a really good thing. Thanks. Um, and as a follow-up, um, the Prime Minister has been asked multiple times about whether there would be um, new taxes in, in, in the budget or higher taxes. And he uh, said uh, that uh, there would not be new or higher taxes for the middle class. Uh, and so the question is, is there going to be new or higher taxes for others, such as Corporate Canada? So the Prime Minister's answer was, of course, accurate and correct. Uh, and uh, here's what I'll say about uh, the fiscal uh, picture in the budget. We recognize that there is an urgent need today to invest in Canada and Canadians. And we recognize in particular that we're at really a pivotal moment for young Canadians, um, for generation, for millennials, for generation Z. Um, that these, right now, for too many young Canadians, the promise of Canada, the kind of Canada that older Canadians came of age in, it doesn't feel like it's working. Um, people can have a good job, they can be working hard, but they are just not sure that's going to lead to a safe and prosperous and secure life, including being able to buy your own home. And that's something that we have to do something about. That requires investments. We are making them. We are absolutely committed to making those investments in a fiscally responsible framework. And we're going to do that. This is what we committed to doing in 2015. We said Canada needs investments, we're going to make them, and we're going to make them in a fiscally responsible way. And in 2015, when we first formed government, we also said we are here for the middle class and those working hard to join it, and we're going to cut taxes for the middle class and we delivered that. We are not a government that will raise the tax burden on hardworking middle class Canadians. Okay, next question. Uh, Marco Vigliotti, iPolitics. Hey, th thanks for taking my question. Um, I, I'm just gonna follow up on the previous question. Um, there, an, NEP, an NEP motion passed the Finance Committee with Liberal support calling in particular for a windfall profit tax on the large grocers. I know that you and Minister Champagne have been focused really on changing competition law to bring down costs in that space. Uh, can you give us though any sense if whether or not uh, you know, a windfall tax on large grocers is on the table right now or if it's not even being contemplated? Uh, 
I was clear about the direction of travel for our government in my previous answer. So we really believe now is a moment that we have to make investments and we're going to do it because Canada needs those investments and especially young Canadians need us to make those investments. Investments in housing, investments in affordability, investments in productivity and growth like the AI announcement that we made on Sunday which is really, really important and I think is going to have far-reaching consequences. We also really believe uh, in the importance of making those investments in a fiscally responsible way and we're going to do that. When it comes to revenue, uh, you know, the conviction at the heart of our government, what we campaigned on in 2015 was a commitment to the middle class and those working hard to join it. And actually in 2015, our commitment was we're going to lower taxes for the middle class. We delivered on that. We remain absolutely committed to being there for hardworking middle class Canadians and we won't raise taxes on them. Um, and my second question, totally unrelated. Um, we've had a flurry of housing announcements over the past weeks related to the budget. You touched upon a few in your opening remarks. I know not all of them touched upon adding new supply, um, but do you have any projections on how many of uh, the, how many homes you're expecting will be built directly flowing from these announcements? And if so, will it be enough to hit the 3.5 million new homes by 2030 target that the CMHC says is needed to um, restore affordability to the market? Um, Thanks for the question. That is a really good question. Um, and you're totally right that, you know, we need to do a lot of things on housing. Um, but the center of our focus is supply, supply, supply. That is the core challenge Canada faces. We recognize that. And we are just working really, really hard, you know, on every front we can identify to get more homes built faster. Um, clearly, um, we want the numbers to work. Uh, and I would say part of the equation, which Mark Miller has been working on really, really effectively, um, is also to be thoughtful about the number of people who are in Canada. And uh, the work he has done on international students the work he has done on uh, visas uh, for Mexico, and the work he has done on temporary residents, those are part of the housing equation as well. Thanks. Uh, ministers, there's one last journalist in the room, I think. Uh, Tonda, go ahead. How could we resist a question from <laughs> Tonda? I'm going to regret having said that in one minute, but. <laughs> Uh, actually, I just want to go back to the announcement that you've made. Um, if I understand it, then you're putting in $500 million over four years, not front-end loaded for a crisis you say is urgent. You are proposing that you will de decide directly with community organizations who gets the funding. It's not on top of the bilateral. I mean, it's on top of the bilateral. Is that right? So my question then is if, part of the bilateral pot of money available to provinces who are responsible for health, who have a better picture of the on-the-ground needs and who needs what and where the resources are. And um, I, I'm, yeah, so why not front-end load it and why not give it straight to the provinces? Well, so we're work we are working directly with the provinces. The bilateral agreements um, are uh, expansive uh, in their direct action uh, for uh, mental health needs in their provinces and understood. But what we've identified, and I know Yara will want to speak to as well, is, is that at a direct community level, there's a, there is a need to um, support uh, additionally uh, at a community level um, uh, the, uh, the capacity at um, uh, for the, the community to be able to directly respond to those needs. So it's about coming at it from both directions. And it, this certainly, when I was talking with my counterparts uh, in, in different provinces and territories, there was an acknowledgement that, um, that the direct partnership that we have with communities works. Uh, and so this is something that builds and is in no way uh, contradictory to the action, in fact, very supportive of the action that we're taking in the bilateral agreements. It means that the province, uh, we can work with a line of sight with them to be able to work directly with them on an integrated approach 
to health and at the same time be able to uh, help build community capacity to be able to uh, directly go after some of those needs that are at a community level. Because even at a provincial or territorial level, um, you're still pretty high up relative to what these concerns are. Um, so it is, um, you know, most of the agreements actually with the provinces when you look at them um, are about direct supports to communities, right? They're not about provincially, in some instances, provincially delivered services, but a lot of times it is about, you know, mobile clinics or supporting, um, supporting a, 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 a local health center. Or, uh, or creating, um, you know, a, a space for people to be able to go in in a community that's funded through, uh, that's funded to a community organization. So this is expansive to that and complementary to it. But I, Yara, you may have some additional thoughts. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, what I will say is this: when through the bilateral agreements, on average, we saw about a 30% allocation. Uh, across 13 provinces and territories towards mental health services but in that in that bucket a lot of it is is you know there's health service provision through 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 the actual systems and there is also partnerships with community organizations on the ground but these community organizations who have a front hand grassroots understanding of what's happening in their communities have been doing this work for decades They've been filling gaps in the system that we are now in partnership in the bilateral agreements meeting the moment, but that the, their raison d'etre in community is still there. It's still much needed. And we want to ensure that we have, not everyone's going to go to a health system for a mental health challenge. We want to make sure that it's a full continuum of support for particularly young people when they need the trust, they need to build uh, safe spaces for themselves that don't always come in the traditional methods that um, of healthcare service providers. So this allows us to really have a hands-on approach with communities on the ground to meet what their youth are asking for and what they need in, in a really Do you consult way. or give the provinces a heads up on this announcement today? And if you did, what was their reaction? If not, why not, given that so many are so furious about the last few weeks of announcements that you've made without giving them a heads up on any of it? I'm going to uh, offer a high-level thought on the investments our government is making and the provinces. Um, there are some urgent needs in Canada today. I would identify housing as the most urgent issue. And Canadians quite rightly expect the federal government to recognize the urgency of that need and to be part of the solution. And that is what we are doing. I really believe that when Canadians need something, all orders of government need to work together to respond to that urgent need. And I have real confidence that we're going to be able to do that. And my confidence is not, you know, based on some Pollyanna-ish worldview. It is based on the real experience of Canada, you know, when you get past the rhetoric um, and some of the public, and, uh, some of the public uh, jousting, um, when there is a real need that, you know, there is a collective recognition of its urgency. As a country, we're actually really good at solving it. And the example I have in mind is early learning and childcare. When we put forward a plan in the budget in 2021 to build a national system of early learning and childcare, I faced a lot of questions from a lot of smart reporters who said, you know, this is a good idea, but people have been talking about it for 50 years. And it is a provincial jurisdiction. How come you think you're going to be able to do it? And what I really believed then was it was time. Canadians wanted us to do it. And people of goodwill were going to be able to come together and make it happen. And that is what we have been doing on child care. We've been talking about the bilateral agreements on health care that Mark has been reaching. Those are really transformative as well. And I am absolutely sure that uh, on other issues, we're going to be able to do that too. Because at the end of the day, we represent the same Canadians. And, you know, 
when you get past uh, the sort of skirmishes, uh, I don't think anyone in Canada disagrees with the idea that we need to do better on housing. I don't think anyone in Canada disagrees with the idea that we need to do better on health care in general, including mental health care. And that's why I really think uh, that we are making it work and we're going to keep on making it work. Thank you very much. We're all late now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ministers. That concludes the press conference.